Good morning, everyone. Kamusta na? For those who are worshiping with us here on site, for those worshiping with us online, to all the first timers, the newcomers here, we are so blessed and we are so happy that you can worship with us this morning and hoping that we will continue to see each other every Sunday to worship together as one family, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You know, this is the first day of the month of May. Right? May 1 now, right? And if you notice, four months have passed already. So that means one-third of 2022 has passed already. You know? Four months. So kamusta na yung four months natin? How is our walk with the Lord for the past four months? Like the song says, we hope that this will be our uh, experience, that every day with Jesus will always be sweeter than the day before. And I hope that everyone is truly experiencing the love of Christ during this uh, crisis. Today, we are also celebrating the 15th wedding anniversary of our beloved Reverend Hem and Ann Sia. Parang di si Hem yan, parang si Nathan eh. <laughs> today, he, they're celebrating their 15, but uh, uh, today they're not with us. They're in Tagaytay. They have to officiate a wedding, but let's extend our prayers, our warmest greetings to show our appreciation to this very uh, committed couple that they've been sacrificing uh, extremely to contribute to the growth of JEC and JCA. You know, election fever is happening now. You know? Eight more days and May 9 will be here for the election. You know? I hope some of us probably are still not yet decided. I'm here not to endorse any candidate, although I'm wearing a light green. You know, and this is not an endorsement of anything. But we hope that we're here just to give some guidelines on how we can vote wisely and be able to act our faith out like true believers. So we just don't look and listen to just the promises given by the candidates, the campaign slogans or even the giveaways, because almost all the candidates will be doing that. No? Import, but most importantly, let's look at the competence, the past records of the candidate. We study closely the character of each candidate and not base our decision on fake news. No? Because at the end, it is the character and competence of the future leader that will be leading us not the campaign slogans, not just the promises, which are often unfulfilled. And as true believers, you know, we have a certain conduct that we need to adhere to. Let us not be so passionate about our candidate, you know, to promote our own candidate that we forget that we are light and salt of the world. You know? Let us not peddle fake news. No, not participate in slandering or bashing other candidates, just to promote our own. And let us not be divided by this election, but simply let's respect each other's choices and decision. May the Lord, may the Holy Spirit guide us to vote wisely in May 9 for the future of our country, because there are so many problems facing not just our country and the world today. Problems like this COVID is not yet finished. Ma? Injustice, terrorism, war, uh, economic problems, financial problems, even in the personal side, we have in-laws problem and relations problem. You now, aside from voting wisely as Christians, we are also responsible to heed his commandment to love your neighbor as yourself. We, are, we would do our part to help address these problems even if we are not directly affected. You know, while these problems are really very challenging and should be addressed, there is something that is much more destructive and much more prevalent. And that problem is a problem of sin. The Bible says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You know, the problem of sin is universal. It's global. 
It's not limited to a particular generation, a particular century, a particular time, a particular place, or a particular group of people. You know, sin came into the world not long after creation <clears throat> and will continue to be present until Christ comes again and reign as king. While it is good for us to desire to help alleviate the other problems people face in the world, like poverty or the epidemic, our primary focus as believers, no? as his followers, should be addressing the problem of sin, first in our own lives and then in the lives of others. The problem of sin is that God is holy and he wants us to pursue holiness as well. But we all know we can never save ourselves or break free from, its, from sin's hold on us. So what is the solution then for the problem of sin? You know, for the past five weeks, we had our series on the fulfillment of God's plan for redemption. Redemption from what? It's redemption from the problem of sin. No? Because for the wages of sin is death. In Romans, uh, in 1 Peter 3, 18, it says, For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. His blood cleanses us from sin. Thus, the remedy of sin is found in trusting in the finished work of Christ alone. This is our most, one of our most basic statement of faith, faith in Christ alone for our salvation. However, Jesus' work with sin was not limited simply to his providing forgiveness of sins and acceptance. There is something else that Jesus provides for us, for those who truly experience transformation. Now, in last week's expository sermon, uh, delivered excellently by our pastor Tello, you know, as Jesus was about to ascend to heaven, he gave us the Holy Spirit to what? To empower us, to give us strength, to give us that power to be able to free us from the power of sin and to obey his commandments. You know, many do not understand this gift of freedom from sin that Jesus has given. Many desire forgiveness. Many desire to be part of the church family. But many also desire to continue conforming to the world. And some even continue to indulging in their own pet sins. Many want the benefits of God's grace without the responsibility of obeying his commandments. And Paul addressed this attitude among the saints in Rome found in our passage for today. In Romans 6, 1 to 4, he says, What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized in Christ, into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. You know, not only have we been forgiven, but we have become, like Paul said, dead to sin. We are free from its power. So like Paul is asking, how can we live in it any longer? Paul mentioned by no means that we should continue sinning. Furthermore, in verse 6 and verse 7 of the same chapter, it says, Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with, so that we would no longer be slaves to sin, for he, has died, for he who has died is freed from sin. And in Romans 6 verse 11, it says, Even so, consider yourself to be dead to sin, but alive to to God in Christ Jesus. Today, even if we forget everything else about today's sermon, kindly remember this verse, no? verse 11. 
Consider, consider yourself dead to sin and alive in Christ. We need to look at sin the same way as God looks at it, not what the world describes it. We are already crucified with Christ. We are made free from sin. God's grace forgive us and set us free from the shackles of sin. And for sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law but under grace. Therefore, as Christians, our goal is to pursue holiness, to be holy. Holy means to be set apart for the Lord to do his work. Now, to understand better, let us take an example of the military academy. No? Entering a military academy is vastly different from the way freshmen enter the, uh, the university. No? Those entering the military academy is subjected to extremely rigorous discipline designed to transform them from easygoing people to well-disciplined cadets to prepare them to become future military officers. The purpose is to have them well-trained, well-disciplined, fully committed men and women for the national and international security and defense of the country. You know the difference between the academy, the military academy and a typical university is that these young men and women have been set apart to become well-trained future military officers. They are set apart for that purpose. Similarly, believers, those who say we are followers of Christ, we are to be set apart. By, we are set apart by God and for God to do His work. You know, if the military needs well-trained, well-disciplined, obedient, fully committed to defend the country from present and future threats, what more does the kingdom of God need well-disciplined, well-trained, fully committed, never give up when the going gets tough people, persevering till the end soldiers to be in the service of the king of kings. That is why Jesus himself gave the standard for the qualifications to those who want to be his followers. Whoever wants to follow me must first deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. That's the standard that Jesus is setting for those who want to be his follower. He doesn't like those who would quit just because the going gets tough, just because there are conflict, just because there are criticism. No? Jesus does not need half-hearted people who wants both the world and likewise the benefits of heaven. Brothers and sisters, it's imperative that we need to be set apart from sinful ways, separated from being conformed to the world into being transformed into the likeness of his son, Jesus. And we can only do so with the supernatural action of the Holy Spirit who works deep inside of us to change us inside and out. The purpose of why Christ has set us free from the power of sin so that we can be what? We can be effective lights and salt of the world. No, we can never be effective lights and salt if our lives are regularly conforming and compromising to the world. And we can declare with Paul that for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. For many of us, we know that verse by heart. But sometimes our lives are showing a different way. For me to live probably is to earn more money. For me to live is to be famous, to have a high position. But for Paul, and I pray that for all true believers, we will both declare with him, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. No, such a wonderful and idealistic picture. Christ's blood has the power to forgive and wash away our sins. And it also makes us free and dead to sin. However, we all know that nearly every hour, some of us, nearly every minute, 
we are sinning in our thoughts, in our words, and in our deeds. But there's seemingly, there's a disconnection between what God has seemingly promised to what is actually happening in our everyday lives. You know, the answer can be found in Galatians 5.17. It says, the desires of the flesh is at war against the desires of the spirit. And the desires of the spirit are at war against the desires of the flesh. You know, we took this up already in our past series on spiritual warfare. These two opposing camps are opposed to each other. And, and sometimes it will try to keep you from doing things that the new person wants to do. As the military has this term, a conduct, unbecoming of an officer, which describes a behavior that is inconsistent with what is expected of a military officer. A conduct unbecoming of a believer would likewise have the same meaning. You know, it is easy for us Christians to condemn those obvious sins like murder, corruption, stealing, adultery, abortion, actually all these things, no? But virtually ignoring what our incoming series is all about the respectable sin and acceptable sins, like maybe ungratefulness, gossip, slandering, especially now in the election campaign. Sometimes we Christians are participating in slandering and spreading of fake news as well. We become more concerned about the sins of the society that the sins of, become sins of the believers becomes acceptable and respectable without any sense of what sin is actually is. Now we are incensed when we, someone ordained probably a practicing homosexual to be a pastor, but we are not concerned with our selfishness, our critical spirit, our lack of self-control. The Bible says whoever keeps the whole truth, the whole law, but fails in one, has become accountable to all. Scripture speaks of God's law as one whole, not individual laws with respective penalties. Whether someone commits murder or just simply entertain lustful thoughts, it's all considered sin and it is breaking God's law. The word sin seems to have disappeared along with the notion. No? In our society today, we don't, want, we don't want to offend people you know, in our gospel presentation by telling them that you are sinners. Parang hirap, no? You present the gospel, you are sinners. Hirap. And sometimes we are redefining the gospel. We are redefining the cross that it no longer convict the sinner of his sin to repent. But rather, we present the gospel as oh, the only way to heaven because we are more concerned to save his self-respect rather than save his soul. We try to make it more acceptable. Brothers and sisters, the cross is going to offend people. It's about dying to self. It's about crucifying your old nature to embrace the new. Reverend Stephen Tan a few weeks back mentioned in his sermon that we are not supposed to be diplomats. We are not supposed to give a message of compromise or conforming. We are supposed to give an ultimatum that it's only through the cross of Jesus Christ that sins can be forgiven. No sin is like COVID or cancer. If we are not careful protecting ourselves or if we left it untreated, this sin can spread throughout our entire being and contaminate every area of our lives. And worse, it can spread from our lives to other people as well because our attitudes, our behavior, our words, our action often have an effect on those people around us. In our two-month series, which starts today, The Respectable Sins, we will be discussing some of the sins that many of us deem acceptable 
that we keep on doing it without feeling any remorse or guilt anymore, that we don't repent anymore. Remember, if we keep on doing something, it becomes a habit. And a habit we know, if we keep doing it, it becomes our character. And this includes good and bad habits. Remember, wrong thinking will lead to wrong attitude, behavior, and wrong action. You know, in his book, Respectable Sin, our, the author Jeffrey Bridges enumerate some respectable sins that we will be taking up in the next few weeks of our series. Yeah, next slide. Mm -hmm. Yeah, these are some of the respectable sins like ungodliness, anxiety and frustration, discontentment, unthankfulness, pride, selfishness, lack of self-control, impatience, and irritability. So it's a sin, no? Anger judgmentalism, envy, jealousy, the sins of the tongue, worldliness. My topic for today is not really part of his list no, in his book, but it is still very evident today. It's called the problem of entitlement. If you look closer to entitlement, this word entitlement, it seems to cover all the other respectable sins that is mentioned by the author. So what is entitlement? Entitlement is the belief that one is inherently deserving of the privilege or special treatment. It is the feeling that you have the right to do or have something you know, without having to work for it. The world today is notorious for our attitudes of entitlement. And it is spreading like COVID these days. You, you can see it in our streets when jeepney drivers just stop in front of you to pick up passengers or motorcycles just go in front of you while you're driving. And during this COVID, the poor would feel entitled to the ayudas. And sometimes the rich also feel entitled to have ayudas. Right? Some would say, bakit wala akong ayuda? Nagbabayad naman ako ng taxes, buwis. Yung iba dyan, hindi nagbabayad ng tamang taxes pero meron sila ayuda. Ba't ako wala? Okay? While living in expensive villages. Corrupt officials feeling entitled to personally benefit from pork barrel. Some players, maybe basketball players, feeling entitled to certain playing time because they feel they are much better, so they deserve better treatment. Children feel entitled to be fed the food that they like or else they will grumble. They will need to have the latest gadgets, latest everything without any form of gratitude. And the list keeps growing and growing. Entitlement is rampant in the society. It's also in our families. But it is also slowly creeping into the church as this entitlement culture infects the hearts and minds of everyday Christ followers. That's why we need to have a constant renewing of our minds or else this entitlement culture will infect us. No? I give my tithes regularly so I deserve a better parking space. I deserve to sit on this particular pew every week. We are entitled to have a better speaker to meet my needs or else, maybe I will go elsewhere na lang. No? I am entitled to have my own opinion, my own views about certain ministries and the list goes on. Remember, entitlement is always about ourselves, our needs, our wants, our benefits, our privileges, our rights, etc. <clears throat> the entitlement mentality goes against the commandment of God to love others like yourself, as we tend to love ourselves way, way above others. The enemy will influence us to think that we deserve more than we do. And when we don't get it, our entitlement 
siren or until entitlement, which is alarm, would start blaring and then we will no longer thinking about others. We always think about what's in it for me. You know, many people who are successful or in power or in position believes other people should do things for them because of who they are or how much money or power they possess, forgetting that everything belongs to God. Even our ability to generate wealth belongs to God as well. When people reach a certain status, some people, no, a certain level of success, sometimes they would feel entitled that everyone should bend backward to help them to meet their needs. These are some of the signs. No? Yeah. Mm. Their personal needs come before everyone else's needs. They believe that it is your job to ensure they have everything they need. Okay? Number two, they will try to make themselves look better by bringing you down. Number three, they are not grateful for what they have in their lives. You now, someone with a sense of entitlement may not say thank you or show signs of appre appreciation for what you have done for them because they believe that it is their right to have them in, in the first place. They act like victims and blame others or outside forces for their problems to make themselves look better. I'm sure after looking at this list, no, we can say we know of people who has symptoms of entitlement. Probably there's someone ongoing in our minds. No? Just a short no, no, to parents. Parents, does your children exhibit symptoms of entitlement? If there is, they have. Who molded them? You know, as parents, we want to give our children the good life, a life that they did not have. We keep on giving to our kids more and more to compensate for our lack of time because we are busy in our work or even in our ministries. And in spite of them already having much. So instead of appreciating, some would whine and demand for more. Why? Because their entitled friends, their entitled classmates have more than them. Well, new phones, even though the phones is only three months old. New shoes, new car, everything new. Many don't actually help in the household chores because we have said, you know, we have helpers that can do a much better job. So you don't need to do that. But still, we still want to give them more. Why? So that our kid will not be left out. And the more we give, the more entitled that child becomes, and the more discontented and appreciated he will become. And no wonder this is spreading like COVID today. And we see in the Bible many powerful people who think that because of their power, position, and riches, they can do anything they want any pleasures they want to indulge themselves in. You no know, characters like King Nebuchadnezzar, you know, King Saul, or King Solomon, who feels he's entitled to have 1,000 wives and concubines. Samson, you know, King Herod, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, feeling entitled, being the temple leaders. And even the disciples, James and John, who felt entitled to be at the right and the left side of Christ in his kingdom. And many, many others who has this problem of entitlement. You know, one of the more popular parables that Jesus taught is the parable of the lost son or the prodigal son. This parable is usually preached, focusing on the father's love and forgiveness. But we can also see the problem of having an entitlement mentality in the parable. Okay, let's go to Luke 15, no? 11. He says, there was a man who had two sons. The younger son said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So the father divided his property between them. The younger son felt entitled to his inheritance. No, he felt so entitled that he would not wait for his father to die 
which was the norm. His attitude is, I don't care if you're alive. I have my own life. No, parents, no, mind your own business, Father. I, I have my own life to live. I want to enjoy the world. So right now, give me my inheritance. ASAP. Again, the root of entitlement comes from what? Self-centeredness, selfishness, and self-interest. He doesn't even care about the feelings of his dad, treating his father with no love, care, or respect whatsoever. And as a reminder to children, never dishonor and disrespect our parents. No? I'm sure that in our minds, you know people like that who doesn't show gratitude to what you have provided. Instead, asking, keep on asking for more and demanding for more. But remember, the sermon today is not primarily for you to think about others having this entitlement mentality. No? It should speak to all of us individually as we ourselves often exhibit entitlement mentality as well. We sometimes may feel entitled that God has to hear my prayers, our prayers, my way, even if I have a wrong motive. Or I will not give my tithes, or I will not go to church, or I will not serve anymore. Let's continue. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off to a distant country, and there, what happened? He squandered, squandered his wealth in wild living. You know, the problem of entitlement is that we think it is unlimited. That wherever you go, whoever you work with, you feel that the world or someone owes you something, even if you have not earned it. Your parents should continue to provide for you, even though you are a professional and married already. Well, there's this expectation. People jump from one job to another because many feel entitled and the company failed to meet his expectation of a promotion or for a raise because they feel they are better than the others even though he has only been there. <clears throat> he has only been there for less than a year. Entitled people never find satisfaction. No such thing as enough. The younger son find no satisfaction. That is why he what? He squandered his wealth in wild living. He continued to search and search for more and more pleasures without finding contentment, true contentment and joy with what he already have. You know, entitlement will lead to the destruction of our lives and even our personal relationship with our Lord and with others. The son lost everything he had. He didn't value the hard-earned money of his father. He wanted to do things his way, my way. It's a very clear example of no accountability, no responsibility. In verse 14, he says, after he spent everything, a severe famine came, and he had to what? To feed pigs or swine. In verse 16, he gladly filled his stomach with the food of the pigs. This son began with the wrong thinking, leading to wrong expectation, expecting that everyone, even his father, owe him special favors and treatment. And those wrong expectations led him to wrong actions. Remember our, our slogan for transformation? But, you know, our theme for this year is transformation by the renewing of our mind. Right thinking, will lead to right attitude, and right attitude will lead to right actions. The opposite can also happen. Wrong thinking will lead you to wrong attitude or wrong expectation, which can turn lead to wrong actions. And often, we have wrong expectations from God. You know, I, I'm serving you, Lord. I'm attending regular service. I'm giving my tithe, serving you. I'm expecting you to bless me with good health, I'm expecting you to give me a long and productive life, a problem-free life. I'm expecting you to heal my relative, 
to bless my business, my career, give me good grades. Sometimes, remember, wrong thinking will lead to a wrong expectations and wrong actions. When we pray, we often pray for our needs. What, what's your prayer request? Can you pray for my family? Can you pray for my business? Can you pray for all these things? My, 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 my. And this self-centeredness epidemic is spreading because we feel entitled to have our needs met first you know, before others. Now, as Christians, we should be the less, least entitled people. Do you know what we are really entitled to? The problem of sin entitles us to hell, to be suffering forever. We are not entitled for heaven because it is only by God's grace. God does not owe us anything, but because of his love, his grace, his mercy, his compassion, he provided us a way out through the cross so that we can spend eternity in heaven. That should be enough for us to have gratitude, no? eternity with God. But often, like last week's message, no? we become so nearsighted. We focus on the temporary, on the present. Our purpose and our acceptance is based on what society, on what culture, on what our friends determines. What others have that you don't have, I must have. Let's continue. The son, no, when he came to his senses, no, the younger son came to his senses. Right here we see that the younger son started to have a renewed mind already, no, which led to right thinking and led to right actions. He said, how many of my fathers have hired men that are better off than me? We know how the parable ended, no? He went back, repented, was forgiven, and restored back to his sonship. And there was a great celebration after. But the story did not end there. What about the older son? The older son knew about it. What was his reaction? The older son answered his father, look, all these years, I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet, you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the what? The fattened calf for him. He became angry. He's not willing to enter the house to celebrate. The older son also has an entitlement mentality, self-righteous, or even a victim mentality. He blamed his father. You're unfair, dad. I serve you faithfully unlike this worthless son of yours. And you didn't even give me a goat to celebrate, but gave the fattened calf to him, to that son of yours who disrespected you. So unfair. Comparison. Comparing. You know, comparison is the thief of joy. And we can see the respectable sin, discontentment, ungratefulness, jealousy in this segment, no? Starting to grow. This is unfair. The older son felt cheated. He thinks he deserves better treatment for what he has done. But which you already have. Because the father said, everything I have is yours. So everything the father have was his already. So the father gave the older son more, much more than what he gave the younger son. This is where jealousy, resentment, and anger started to build up and harden the heart of the older son. The older son represents self-righteous people, critical of others, no, I'm better than you, so I deserve more than you. I'm serving, I'm serving the Lord more, so I am entitled to more. I deserve more. Have we come to God with the same heart? Lord, I'm serving you almost every day. 
But why are you others more blessed than me? Why do I feel that I'm being left out? So unfair, Lord. I deserve more blessings from you. You know, entitlement is present in the young rebellious son, but also present in the faithful older, oldest son, eldest son. And it can also be present in all of us as well. If we struggle with this, may I suggest the following on how we can overcome it? We can take a picture for us to remember better. No? Of course, number one is our theme, right? Transformation by the renewing. Without the daily renewing of our mind, transformation will never happen. No? We need to have the right thinking that God does not owe us anything. As sinners, we are entitled for hell, but it is only by His grace that we are able to be called children of God. And as His children, yeah, we can boldly come to His presence with our requests, not our demands. We can come to His presence with our requests, not our demands. Number two, surrender your all to God. Remember Jesus when he was the Garden of Gethsemane? He said, not my will, but yours, Father. Do not entertain unbiblical expectation that God has to answer our prayers our way. We must have the right frame of mind. Seek first his kingdom. Number three, count your blessings and cultivate a heart of gratitude. Both the younger and the eldest son failed to count their blessings. Person was complaining about his old shoes until he met a man with no feet. Again, comparison is the thief of joy. If we keep comparing ourselves with the more affluent people, we will cultivate a heart of discontentment and ingratitude. Count your blessings, like the song says, count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God has done. Don't count the blessings of others. Count the blessings that God has given. Number four, whoever wants to be great in God's kingdom must be the Everyone mentioned it, servant of all. Servant has no rights. And servant is not entitled to anything. A servant's calling is to serve his master faithfully. Of course, the last one is deny ourselves to take up our cross and follow. The problem of entitlement and the other acceptable sin is the same as the problem of sin. It is universal. It is global, it is not limited to a particular generation, time, area, or people. And we need a savior. We need to acknowledge that it is sin. And we need to repent and have the blood of Christ cleanse us from our sins. We need to remember that the cross has also the power not only to forgive and to wash away our sin, the cross has also the power to give us freedom from sin as we have already crucified our old nature. Again, remember that verse, consider yourselves dead to sin, but alive in Christ. Now imagine our military or government is made up of entitled officers, generals, soldiers, officials, always thinking about themselves first. Now what will our country become? Country's security and economy would be severely compromised and weakened. Imagine if God's kingdom is made up of entitled members, all thinking about themselves, their own self-interest, their opinions, what others can do for them, no longer obeying his commandment to love others at themselves. Not only can we not be effective lights and salt of the world, but surely his judgment will certainly come one day. God's kingdom doesn't need people who always feel they are entitled to something. Sometimes I always, I hear this, no, 
I need to rest for this year because I was so busy serving last year. Now, I've, I've heard this several times. No? I was so busy last year, so this year I'm entitled for my rest. No? But we need people who know that they have been set apart, well-disciplined, well-equipped, never give up attitude soldiers who will be persevering to the end for the Lord. Of course, we know the famous quote, as I am, by John F. Kennedy, ask not what your country can do for you, but ask what can we do for our country. And if we tweak it a bit, you no, know, can say, ask not what the Lord can do for you. Ask not what your church can do for you, but ask what I can do more for the Lord today and daily, and what can I do for his church? Whoever wants to follow Jesus must first deny himself, take up his cross, and follow him. Let's bow our head for a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for this time that it's a reminder for us again that you desire us to be fully committed. You don't want half-hearted people in your service. That's why you set the qualification, the strict, rigid qualification that those who want to follow me, follow you, Lord, must first deny himself. Take up your cross. Take up his cross and follow. Lord, help us be a reminder that from today on for and onwards, Lord, we want to be fully committed, fully equipped soldiers of your kingdom standing firm not compromising and conforming to the world but remember that we are set apart for you and to do your work thank you lord in jesus name we pray amen